We have a distinguished speaker here, Jeremy, who is a senior uh, managing partner, and he's an experienced project professional. He's a PMP, just like all of us, with a track record in lar large projects in uh, nuclear, mining, and the oil and gas industry. He's also a certified coach. He's one of the founders of Project Value Delivery, a Singapore-based company which focuses on empowering organizations to, rel to realize the success, etc. Jeremy is a published author of two books. How glad we are. We are getting a lot of these authors to be able to you know, enlighten us on a lot of things. So Jeremy has written The Fourth Revolution, as well as his new book, Project Soft Power. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeremy. Over to you. Thank you. Can you all hear me? So I've been warned, good morning first. Morning. So I've been warned by the organizers that uh, it's one of the toughest slots just before lunch. And I know I'm in Singapore, right? So I need to tell you lunch is not going to be served before I'm finished. <laughs> OK. So this talk is about great project leaders. And actually, I find that a lot of things should have been said since yesterday morning really fit into this concept. But I want just to start with an advertisement. You know, I mean, I'm all in all these project management uh, groups on LinkedIn, and I receive a bunch of advertisements for new project books. And this is an advertisement I received like a few months ago, a few weeks ago. Maybe a lot of you received it also. And I'd like to reflect with you a little bit not so much about the book, which I'm sure is a pretty good book, but what was written in the advertisement, the copywriting. First of all, I'd like to know how many PMPs in the room. Can you just raise your hands, all those who are PMPs? OK, well, well done. Well done for the hard work to get the, cert the certification. So I'd like to, to read with you some of the ex excerpts of this uh, advertisement. Because this is a book about workflows for product management. And it prompts and instructs product managers in every step of the project life cycle. Would you like to read this book? Now, it prepares even an inexperienced reader with no previous PM skills to manage the entire project life cycle from A to Z. Practical techniques and so on. So, so for those of you who don't have PMP, you don't need, it's all in the book. <laughs> now, I got another one, which is even better. It minimizes the need for the experience on expensive product managers, as a workflow will protect the less experienced product managers against most project lifecycle errors. So don't give this book to your boss. <laughs> and it clearly identifies roles and responsibilities of all product staff, including management, making their personal biases, guesses, incorrect assumptions, and gut feelings. Irrelevant, no emotions. So when I read this, I kind of figure out you know, the, the image which pops in my mind about the role of the product manager is this. <laughs> so you got a huge machine, a huge process, and as a product manager, you get there on top just to put some oil, you know, just to make it work properly. And whenever you get a question, just read the manual. <laughs> or this one. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> That's also a very process-driven one. Huh? Is that really the role of the product manager on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it so easy? Are you just the engineer that kind of lubricates the machine? I personally, I adopt it. And then even with this big machine, you, got a, you, can, you can have some problems with people. You can crush people. It can be very dangerous. All of you who've seen this movie, remember that's the main topic of the movie, right? Now, the thing is, even with these uh, processes, we all know the statistics, OK? Always the same. Every year I, co I come here, it's always the same. It doesn't change. Two thirds of projects fail. That's for projects in general. But you also have statistics for mega projects. It's the same. Okay, project failure is outright failure, or just doesn't deliver the return on investment. It's always the same. So, because these books saying, OK, these are all these great processes, 
just follow these processes and you'll be successful as product managers. And then you got this issue, right? So what happens? My point, and what I want to demonstrate to you in this presentation, is that you need to shut down this mechanistic view of product management. Product management is not just a process that you need to follow. It's just not a mechanism. It's not something which is engineered. You need to deal with it differently. It's just a human adventure. It's all about the team. It's about creating stuff which has never been created before. That's why project leaders need projects of power. And actually, I was quite happy uh, this year because I heard a lot of presenters talk about project leaders instead of project managers. I hate the project manager terminology because project managers, the manager concept is okay, I have a process and just need to optimize it and be the most efficient possible and just put the resources, okay? It's really this process-driven idea. But in reality, it's not, the, it's not this which is going to happen. You know, if you want to be successful in your projects, you need to be a real project leader. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, what's the difference between a project manager and a project leader? There is a very simple way of looking at it, which I like. One of them is doing things right. Who is it? It's a manager. The manager is doing things right, as per the book, OK? Now, what does the leader do? He does the right thing, right? Which is quite different. He focuses on what is right for the project, notwithstanding making sure the process is running and whatever. So we did some research, and uh, we are doing a lot of consulting with organizations doing large projects. And we came up with this concept of uh, project soft power. And just to make it memorable, we uh, modeled it with five roles which you need to do as a project leader. And these five roles are the following. First, you have the spider, then the kung fu master, the entrepreneur, the team coach, and the people catalyst. And we're going to look at these five roles, one after the other, just for you to understand what it takes to be a very great product leader. OK, th this is just to show you how it fits into, uh, into uh, our concept. We are doing a lot of consulting. We are setting up systems and processes for companies doing large projects, because of course, you can't do projects without having systems and processes. OK, you can't run a billion dollar project using an Excel spreadsheet. That doesn't work. But at the top of the pyramid, we have put also projects of power. I'm a certified coach, and I realize every time I go into an organization how my coaching skills help me being effective as a consultant just to change the way people are behaving in projects. And the good thing is that these projects of power skills can be learned. So I'm going to give you, right now, a tip which uh, you can use in your everyday life. Posture, OK? So we all know our emotions influence our posture, right? If I'm depressed, I tend to be like this. If I'm excited, I tend to be like this, right? Now, there's one particular posture I would like to share with you is a problem. And I see about like 30% of you have this posture right now in this room. It is this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to tell you why it is a problem. It is because studies have shown that if you listen to my talk or to anybody else's talk having crossed arms and crossed legs, you're going to retain only 50% of what you're going to retain if you have an open posture. So keep an open posture. I mean, you came here, you did the effort of coming here, not just for me, but for the, the other speakers. Try to make sure you maintain an open posture and an open mind during the presentations, because then you're going to get the most of it. This is something you can train yourself to do. And when I, when I learned about it, you know, obviously you always have these situations where you tend to close yourself well. 
proactively you can say, oh, I'm closed, I need to open myself, I need to open what's happening. You know, maybe I'm closing myself because I feel threatened somehow. But then open yourself. And you can do that consciously, okay? It's difficult to change your mood consciously, but it's easy to change your posture. So these skills can be learned. It's just about training oneself. So let me go into uh, these different projects of power roles, and I'll start with the spider. Now the spider is about the network. Would you agree with me that as a project leader, you need to have a strong network? Yes? No? Okay, interestingly, one of the differences between the PMBOK 5th edition and the PMBOK 4th edition, for those who have a PMP or are trying to get a PMP, is that they took out the stakeholder management out of the communication and split it, right? Because it's so important, stakeholder management is so important, but I hate the terminology stakeholder management, no? We are back into, okay, I need to have a process to manage my stakeholders. I prefer to say, well, you need, as a project leader, to maintain a network, you need to maintain the network which is going to be useful for you as a project leader. So I like this uh, quote from uh, Sun Tzu. Knowing others and knowing oneself in 100 battles, no danger. Or 100 projects, no danger. Not knowing the other and knowing oneself, one bad project for one good project. Okay, it doesn't say what happens if you don't know yourself but you can figure it out, okay? So it's important to know yourself, but it's also important to know what you have around there in your environment. This is an example of a social graph. And what I just want to highlight here is that we all know some people are more connected than others, okay? Some people tend to be at the center of all kinds of networks. So when you are strategizing, who are the guys in your network you want to contact with? Who are the guys you want to be connected with? Are you going to choose the guys who are at the, the end of the chain? Are you going to choose the guys who are the most connected? The most connected, right? So you can make a choice and you can prioritize who in your network you're going to privilege to engage in a deep contact. So the spider, as a product leader role, looks pretty simple, but it's a bit tough, I can tell you. You need to strategize and develop a specific network with your projects covering all the relevant stakeholders and your priorities. You need to focus on those guys who are there, the most connected and have the most influence. But I want, what I want to highlight most is that you, do, you need to do that at an emotional level, okay? If you really want to have the connection with somebody, you need to do that at an emotional level. And we are going to train right now on that. This is called networking, but I want you to do a bit more, okay? Here, networking is, oh, I give you my business card, I receive your business card, I look at it, it looks great, it's nice colors, oh, your position is this. Well, that's not emotional level. Would you agree with me? So what I want you to do, we are going to take about one minute, is turn to your neighbor and try to connect with this neighbor by exchange business cards, if you haven't done that, okay, that's the basics. But then, try to connect with your neighbor at an emotional level. So how you do that? You do that Well, ask about what is your passion? What is important for you in life? What kind of sport do you like to do? Try to learn something personal about the person next to you, okay? So can we do it one way and then the other way? And then we'll discuss how good it is to have an emotional connection with a person instead of just having a business card connection. Can we do that? Okay, we take one minute. Find a neighbor. And after I'm going to go and if you continue, you, won't, you will have lunch late. <laughs> okay. There will be other opportunities later during my presentation to speak with your neighbor. Okay, the second role is a Kung Fu master. It's all about focus and discipline. Because you need to have focus and discipline when you are a project leader. Okay, what you want to achieve is to get rid of the obstacles you have that prevent you from reaching your, your objectives as a, in the project. And generally, there are not so many, okay? Generally, when you are in a project, 
you have a li very limited number of constraints which are driving your project delivery, not so many. So you want to be able to identify these constraints and tackle them and being effective at it. Everybody knows this 80-20 rule. That is to say 20% of uh, the causes create 80% of the effects. In real life, it's maybe more like 10% cause 90%. What people know less is that it comes from the complexity theory, okay? So it's applicable to all sorts of complex systems, and this includes projects conducted in complex environments. So the issue for you as a project leader is to figure out, okay, what are these 10% which I need to tackle so that I get 90% of the effects? And for that, the first thing is it requires a lot of discipline. I'm not saying, I've never been saying that processes are not useful, okay? You need to, to um, conduct them at the right level, and you need to conduct them with discipline. One of the issues I uh, often find as a consultant is that uh, people tell me, yeah, yeah, we got a process, we got a process for planning, we got a process for reporting, and whatever, you look at it, and it's not, not done with the right discipline. So discipline should look like this every morning as a project leader. You can try that one also. <laughs> now the other thing I like to say is that something else I see during my consulting uh, uh, missions is that I find people concentrating on some details, no? And they kind of forget about the big picture. <laughs> so because they look at too much detail, they don't have enough time for analysis. So the Kung Fu master runs the product management processes against all odds, okay? Make sure you got your back office running. But in terms of focus, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have too many priorities. So very often I go in organization in projects and I ask the product manager, one of the, my first questions is, okay, can you show me what are your priorities? And then the guy says, yeah, yeah, I'm going to take out my spreadsheet. Okay, let me tell you something. That's pretty simple, but if you're, you need a spreadsheet to manage your priorities, these ain't priorities. You've got too many of them, okay? If you've got too many priorities, it's not priorities, and you can't do them. So what I suggest is that you don't have more than what I call the two plus one priorities, one medium-term objective, one long-term objective for your project, and the one which shall always remain is enhancing your team. And we're going to see that in the team coach role. But think about it, okay? If you have too many priorities, they won't get done. The only way is to have one priority, maybe two, and when you get it resolved, then you can have a new one. But this is a very deep problem uh, I see in a lot of organizations. And actually, when you tell people, okay, you need to prioritize, people say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to prioritize, I'm going to do that. But then the hardest question is, what are you ready to stop doing? And it's true for us in our personal life, okay? We tend, or I tend, to take always more stuff because I'm passionate about a lot of things, but at some stage it just overflows. So the, the question I need to ask myself is, what am I ready to stop doing? Because I can't do everything. And it's a much harder question. Okay, let's, let me move to the entrepreneur. So entrepreneur is about being able to spend now for future returns. And I find it a very differentiating skills in a lot of organizations, but we all know this curve, okay? If you invest at the beginning, your ability to influence is much greater than if you invest later during the project. Do we agree with that? Yeah. All your PAP, PMP guys, you should have had a, at least one question on that one. So for the others, learn it, okay? So why on earth, when I go to my clients, at the beginning of a project, they tell me, yeah, but we can't spend this, no? This is cost. No, it's not cost, it's an investment. You need to invest at the beginning of a project on the number of things to make sure that it be, it's successful later. You can't be cost-oriented, you need to be investment-oriented. Okay, this is a curve from the PM book. 
And unfortunately, in the PM box, the initiating process group looks very small on this curve, you know? But for me, it should be, look much bigger than the other ones, because it's what makes a project a success or a failure. It's where you invest, and it's where you decide, in a large part, whether it's going to be a success. Now, one of the things I want to share with you is a project, like putting this thing together here, generally composed of a number of parts which you eventually put together to create a product. OK? So that's a product manager coming in. That's you. Try to fix this thing. So you put it all together, OK? And suddenly you figure out, oh, what is this? Where, where does it fit? <laughs> I forgot about it. So my point is most projects fail because there is a small piece missing which is not there on time. Would you agree with me? It's the case for at least large projects. You get 90% of the stuff there, but you're missing the 10%, and then everybody is waiting for what's missing. So it's what we call convergence. Your focus needs to be on convergence. It serves nothing to get 90% of the product right if you are missing the small piece which doesn't allow you to finish it. So as an entrepreneur, you always or you often need to invest early. It's more important to get something on time than to pay the lowest cost on it. The lowest bidder in a project is not a good idea if you can't guarantee the time. Everything is in time. You don't want your entire project to stand by waiting for a small piece missing because you went for the lowest bidder. You need to anticipate and to invest early. So let's do another exercise with your neighbor. Now you are emotionally connected, so you can ask tough questions. So I'd like you to ask your neighbor, in their current work context, one thing they, sh they could stop doing right now in their project, and one thing they should invest in. OK? So let's do that one minute one way, one minute the other way. Can we do that now? All right? One thing you can stop doing, and one thing you should invest in. Is that tough? Yeah, it's tough, but now you should be emotionally connected to your neighbor, right? All right. I hope that by now you got uh, actions when you go back. So we've seen three roles up to, up to now. The spider with the network, the kung fu master about discipline and focus, and the entrepreneur. So that, now let me move to the softer parts, which are team coach and the people catalyst. Nothing beats a real team. It's all about people. And you certainly don't want to be there at the top as a project leader, if you're not sure that the team is strong at the bottom. So I'd like to take a, a comparison, a football comparison, well known, OK? Barcelona and Real Madrid. And the way they play their teams differently. So basically, the general idea is that Barcelona is a club which grows its own players. And he gets the juniors to play with uh, big names very often. Whereas the Real Madrid, they tend to buy outside very expensive players, but they don't tend to grow their young players because they don't give them the opportunity to go and play. So who do you think are the most successful team on the long term? Barcelona, right. So why? No divas. And if you've got a diva in your team, if you can, try to get rid of him or her. <laughs> Emotional connection within the team. You need to have creative conflict. There was a talk about that uh, yesterday. And you need to be able to entertain tough discussions. Now, what makes projects successful okay, are not processes. It's the people. People who take initiative to the lead teams that work together and realize incredible feats. 
Now, what I would like to share with you, my experience as a consultant, is this. Very often, I come to, as a consultant, I'm here to solve problems, right? 95% of the cases, I solve problems by finding somebody in my client's organization who got the answer. Now, do you realize that? OK, I know some stuff as a consultant, but still 95% of the cases, I go in my client's organization, they say, I have a problem. Why, did you, why didn't you talk to the guy on the other side of the corridor? He's got the answer for you. Much better than my answer, because this guy knows the organization. So think about it when you've got a problem. It generally means that the person with the information you need was not invited. And this person is there in your organization, not, not necessarily outside. So we all know the workplace conditions can be quite challenging during projects. It can be really tough. And that's kind of obvious, OK? The weakest link in your team will define the strengths of your team. Now, I'm often called by senior management to figure out, OK, what's happening in a project? Why doesn't it look successful? What can you do about it? So they generally expect me to delve into you know, processes and systems and work out the cost and whatever. But I generally have a very simple criterion. OK, any team we are blaming has started, this is the end. I can predict with quite a good accuracy that about 100% of these teams will fail. So a very important role of the project leader is to make sure that blame doesn't start. It's going to be tough, OK? In a project, it's not easy. You're creating new stuff in a new environment. Things are going to happen not according to the plan. It's going to be tough. But if, when it gets tough, one part of the team starts blaming the other, I can predict failure. So as a project leader, your role is to make sure this never happens. It should not be allowed to start. I can't make it clear. No? So, so my clients are sometimes a bit astonished that after like half a day, I'm there telling them, well, you know, I can tell you this project is going to fail. Because they are just all blaming each other, right? So how can they manage to get it running? That doesn't work. As a project leader, your first responsibility is to make sure blaming doesn't start in your team. OK, let's move to the last, last one, which is a people catalyst, appreciating the people, people's potential. And I put an acorn here because I like this uh, concept of uh, appreciative coaching, which is uh, being able to see the mighty oak in the acorn. Think about it. In your organizations, how well do you know the people working with you? Do you know their family situation? Do you know their passions? Do you know what they did before? Do you know what they could bring to the team apart from what is written in their job description? It's amazing in organizations which generally don't know people beyond their job title. Now, as a people catalyst, you need to be able to see beyond that. You need to be able to know your people enough so that you can see what, they are, what is their potential. And you need to see what is in the icon. So really know, know your people. That's really key. And in projects, something always happens is that, OK, PMBOK and all the others say, OK, you need to set up the organization, and then everybody should have their job description. OK, this is very nice. But if your team really works together, and when your project evolves, people are not going to do what is written in their job description. Their role is necessarily going to change during the project. And then you've got events happening. And when these events happen, you need to rely on some talents of the people, which are not necessarily why they were put there in the first place. How can you leverage on this talent if you don't know what the people know, what they can do? And often, it's not why you hired them primarily. So it's very important to be able to catalyze out of people their real talent to be able to be successful in products. So I'd like you to, to come out of this uh, 
This talk with a new technique, very useful technique. It works in the workplace. It also works uh, at home. How to give feedback. But before I do that, I just want to share with you how often do you get real tough feedback in the workplace? How often? We would say never. A few times a year, real tough feedback. OK? Every month? All the time? Wow. Well, my experience is you don't get this feedback often. Real feedback, you don't get it often. Every time you get it, you should take it as a gift instead of treating it as an offense. Would you agree with me? So it's also a gift you can give to people. But now, obviously, if you want the feedback to be effective, you need to make it in a way where people don't get defensive. So I got a very simple eight-step technique, and it works perfectly every time. OK, the first thing is when you want to give feedback to somebody, you need to be present. This means you're not looking at your computer and your mobile phone at the same time. Okay, You need to be there. 100% with the person. Then the second thing you need to do is to ask permission. Is it a good time to give feedback to you? Maybe the person says no, then in that case, okay, you come back later. But generally, people will say yes. Now it's fantastic because once they said yes, they can't say no after. <laughs> okay? So once they said yes, you know you can proceed, and they will not say at any moment, oh, no, but by the way, no, it was not a good time to give feedback. State your purpose and positive intention. You don't give feedback to hurt people. You give feedback because you got a positive intention to improve them, to, uh, to make sure that uh, they will be more successful. So you need to state that. You need to put a context around it, why you are doing, giving feedback. And then you share your personal perception of the performance or behavior. That is to say, I. I have observed that in the last meeting, your posture was not right, or your body language was not right, for example. I think this has such and such consequence. So you need to own it. Don't say, like I hear very often, no, by the way, uh, my friend said that at the last meeting you didn't. <laughs> OK, that doesn't work. You need to own it. Then you can provide some suggestions for improvement. And then you ask an open question to get remarks. So I don't need to explain to you what is an open question, because we've seen that in the previous session. It's all these questions starting with what and how, to which you don't answer with yes or no. OK? Then just stop and listen. See what the person has to say. It might take a little bit of time until this person says something, so just stay quiet. And then you might jointly decide action. This framework is fantastically effective for giving feedback. You know these situations in organization where you know somebody is not behaving satisfactorily. Everybody knows it except the person. Yeah? It ne never happens in an organization, I'm sure, but personally, I see that all the time. Just because nobody has been able to give them feedback, true feedback. It's tough to give feedback. And a lot of managers and leaders don't know how to do it, or won't do it, or think they have more important stuff to do. But if you follow this framework, which is pretty straightforward, it's easy to give feedback. It's easy to give this gift to people. Huh? And it's pretty effective because people are going to receive it without feeling hurt. So I'm not going to ask you to give feedback to your neighbor right now. <laughs> also, that could be an interesting exercise. What about the positive Same framework? Same for feed positive feedback. So except of feedback, we're going to do feed forward. <laughs> uh, and the, the exercise is simple and still will look a bit strange for you. So this is how it works. You state to your neighbor a problem you face right now. Let's say in the workplace, but if you want to tackle a personal problem, can also. 
a problem you face right now, and then you ask the person, OK, what's your suggestion? So this person will give a suggestion, which is a feed forward. Now, here comes the tough part of it. You receive a suggestion, but instead of reacting like you would do usually by no, but however, you just say thank you. Because we are not used to that, right? So we are going to react to this suggestion given by a foreign person, which we didn't know like 30 minutes earlier, saying, no, this, this is probably going to be dumb, right? But you'll be surprised that if you take it positively, thanking the person, how grateful you can be, because very often it's, go it's going to be a very useful suggestion. So can we do that? So the exercise is when you receive a suggestion, OK, don't react defensively. Just open yourself and say thank you. So can we do that one way with your neighbor, with which you are now have a very uh, a tight emotional connection? <laughs> State a problem you have. Listen to the suggestion. Don't be defensive. Just say thank you. So we've gone through the five roles of Project Soft Power. And just before concluding, I would ju just like to give you a little bit of context about why it is so important in the world today to have these skills, and why process approaches were maybe good a few decades ago, but they are not anymore applicable. And that's what I call uh, the fourth revolution. So what happens right now is this. Now, actually, this picture is a bit outdated, because probably now this guy is running in the jungle with an iPad. <laughs> but you, you get the general idea, right? <laughs> we are people basically, physically the same like a few hundred years ago. But now we got communication capabilities, which have never nothing to compare with what we had even years ago. And it's what I call the fourth revolution, because it's a revolution in communication capabilities. The first revolution was when we started speaking a few uh, thousand years ago. Second one, when we started writing. It was the age of the empires. The third is when we started uh, broadcasting with printing and then TV and radio. That was the industrial age start. But now we got a new capability, which is long distance interactive communication for free. Now, those of you who are my age or older, you probably still think when you pick up the phone to call the US or to call Europe or Japan or long distance, you probably still think about how much that's going to cost. Because it was so costly to call long distance even 15 years ago. Today, it doesn't cost anything. The cap communication capabilities we have right now have, are incredible, unprecedented. So that's what it is all about. And I am going to explain to you very quickly why it changes everything in the workplace and, and in the world we are living. Today, complexity is at the heart of all human ventures. So you probably have seen this uh, slide, which was a slide presented to General Ma uh, one of the generals who came to Afghanistan as a briefing, and he said something like, the day we understand the slide, we'll win the war in Afghanistan. OK, complexity is about having a lot of different groups of people with different aims and purposes, and all very interlinked together, and this creates an unpredictable uh, system. And projects are more and more looking like this today, when you look at your stakeholder maps. The, the organization transforms. So why do you think the traditional industrial age organization is a hierarchical organization? There is one good reason for this. Any idea? Hierarchy, hierarchy but a hierarchy has got a reason. OK, the reason is communication was very expensive, right? So the way to organize an organization to minimize the communication links is to have a hierarchical organization. 
When you have to speak to somebody at the other end of our, the organization, there are only a few steps to go. Okay, and unfortunately, he goes to the top manager. So he's kind of the bottleneck there. But it is just a way to organize so that you minimize the communication links you need. Okay? But today, this restriction of minimizing communication doesn't exist anymore. You can have an entirely worked, uh, networked organization where everybody communicates to everybody, in theory. Facebook type, OK? So there is no need to have hierarchy anymore. This is just a remnant from the industrial age. But eventually, it's going to disappear. So the way I look at organizations in the future is like this. Okay. For those who know, this is, a, this is a picture of a turbulent flow. So what happens in a turbulent flow? You've got these vortices, which could be project teams creating and then disappearing and then creating again. So you've got these project teams being created temporarily and then dissolving and then created again, maybe different contributors. And that's the way organizations are going to look like in the collaborative age. And the hierarchy, you don't need it anymore. So in the scale age, it was all about rational IQ. And the bad thing was, well, you were born with a good IQ or not, and that's it. No, you were either intelligent or dumb, but you couldn't do anything about it, in theory. So I like this, uh, this picture, because it says computing division, computing section. So you need to remember that in the 1920s, people were selected at university as being very good, fast uh, computers by hand and then put together in some kind of organization to try to create some computing capability. You also need to remember that we send people on the moon using this computer, a sliding ruler. Who has used a sliding ruler here? A few. So it was all about rational approach. And actually, you know, this guy was probably very clever. But that's not really worth anymore. Today, we have complex problems. And the only way to tackle complex problems is emotional work. It's connecting with people. Because at the end of the day, it's all about people, right? And you can't tackle complex projects using rational approaches, or just processes, or this kind of things. You need to have emotional work. And that's what all project leadership is all about, being able to deliver emotional work. Project leaders should spend more time doing emotional work than rational work. So as a conclusion, not only we need you to become a great project leader, but you all can become a great project leader if you practice a few skills, because you can learn it. It's not easy, OK? It's difficult to learn these skills and practice them consistently, but you can do it. And some of you in this room, I know, eventually, will manage to do it. That's probably how you feel sometimes when you start a project. But remember, projects are, first of all, a human adventure. People are hiding behind systems and processes and organizations and departments and whatever. But at the end of the day, it's just about people. And only teams that focus on the right thing will succeed. So what does it take to become a great project leader? Now you know the five words, so I'm going to uh, shut up. <laughs> You're going to tell me. The spider, the kung fu master, the entrepreneur investing, the team coach, and the people catalyst. It's all essential, and all the skills I talked to you about today are useful in your workplace, but they are also useful in your personal life. It's all about developing your emotional intelligence. You can learn, you can train. It's all what you need to become a great project leader. If you want to know more about it, there are a few books I wrote, and they are for sale in uh, where we have lunch, and you got the website there. But my main message to you right now is this. If you believe now you know everything about products of power and you can just go back and do it, nah, it doesn't work. <laughs> but if you put in the application and concentrate on it, then eventually you get there. 
and you become one of these great product leaders developing, uh, executing billion dollar projects without a flow. Thank you all for your attention, and now I think we can open the floor for questions. So because I know that it's lunch time, uh, for the, everybody asking a question gets a book. There you go. So we do have a few minutes. You got any questions for Jeremy? I think there's a question over there. Hi. OK. Can you hear me? Yep. OK, thanks for the excellent presentation. You said uh, the hierarchy is needed for communication mainly. And you foresee that it will vanish eventually. May I ask you to please take a seat just for five minutes? I'm sorry. Thank you. My question is, how do you go about decision making if there are no hierarchies in place as well? If it's just to avoid expensive communication and cancel the hierarchy structure, how do you go about decision making? Well, there are a number of uh, quite interesting uh, organizational uh, experiments going on, in particular in software, in the software industry in the US, where you've got some self-organizing organizations. OK? This is to say people are there, they contribute. Some leaders eventually pop up, in particular in some areas, but you don't, don't really have this kind of uh, traditional hierarchy. And it works. And these companies are profitable. So it's not going to be easy to find the right model. And then the, the organization and what it does needs to fit it. But I'm quite convinced that uh, at some stage, you won't need all these heavy hierarchy. So you might still have some people. I mean, you need to have some people having a bit more authority, but you won't have so many or so many levels as in the traditional organizations. Thank you. I think we have one more question here. Uh, hello. Uh, we spoke about how do you become a, you know, a project leader. Yep. But uh, do you have any advice on how do you sustain project leadership? Well, uh, other than train harder and train smarter, yes. something else. I think the best way, I'm not going to answer directly to, the, to your question, but I think the best way to maintain yourself as a project leader is to train other project leaders. OK, so basically role models, follow some role models, is that what you're saying? It's just because when you train other people, and you, 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 you really do uh, training by yourself, you necessarily gain a lot in depth in terms of understanding of what it takes. And yourself, you're going to develop yourself much, much more as a master, I would say. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Here, we have one more question here. And then two more over there. Oh, good morning. In the area that you spoke about in reference to uh, feedback, um, asking uh, or getting the right setting, is there, in your research so far, uh, on the follow-on, when you noticed uh, at the last point where it said the deciding the, the um, joint action. Yeah. Um, in your uh, experience, um, has most of that normally turned out to be positive, or is it still just the person who you're, you're getting feedback from, um, um, does it turn out to be more mostly positive, or does someone say, well, I'm not going to do that? Or what does what your experience uh, uh, show? OK, what's important, I think, is for the person to come up with their own answers or their own commitments. Okay, you're, you're not going to impose it to the person you give feedback to, because they are in their particular situation. They might not feel like they want to do what you think would be good for them, but maybe they will come with something, a first step. Where it is really important is, I think, to help them sustain it. Because it's quite easy to say, oh, well, no, maybe you are right. There's something I didn't do. Or maybe they will, they will just say, well, no, you're the only one telling me this, so maybe I wait for a second guy to tell me. But let's say they decide for something. What's important is that you help them sustain it in a non-intrusive way. And I think that's the most important. Thank you. And one there's more one more question over there. Hello. Where are you? Oh, yeah, please hello, go Jeremy. ahead. Nice presentation. I've got a question for you around um, cultural diversity in projects, yeah. right, given the global environment. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the spiders and the connections with stakeholders. Oftentimes, these stakeholders could come from very different perspectives or mindsets. Uh, sometimes these are organizational perspectives, mm -hmm. and sometimes they are national identities or cultural mindsets. Yeah. Um, in, in your experience, what's the, uh, what's the key solution or, or, or success strategy you would apply 
uh, in, in a diverse environment to be a, a successful project leader? Well, I think uh, and it's pretty it's a important. Really loaded question. Yeah. It's a pretty important uh, success factor for the team. You need to have a diverse team. If you don't reflect in your team the diversity of the world which is outside, how can you expect to be successful? Yeah. Assuming the diverse team that you have, what's, as a project leader, how do you manage the diversity? What's the key ingredient? Well, for me, uh, be, be, being open and uh, having, I mean, I, I worked in a lot of uh, cultural sed settings and being authentic and open to the people, I've never had any issue working uh, cross-cultural teams. And then when you have that, it's pretty easy to manage uh, your stakeholders because then you can empower people in the team to manage the stakeholders they feel the closest to. And it's also a great de development opportunity for people in the team. Thank you. I think one last question over there. If you could pass on the microphone to your right. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, I have one question. Uh, I don't think we can hear you. It'll be turned on. No. Hello. Try. Try again. Hello. I'll, I'll repeat the question. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what I'm asking is that now we are saying that the scenarios are like the projects are getting divorced and then getting executed, closed, then again teams are dissolved, teams are again coming up, and then new team will be there to do next work. Yeah. So don't you think that engagement will be one of the challenge for the project manager? Mm, yes. Yes, except it's not going to be a, okay. So the question okay, was me, sorry. Let me repeat the question. The question was: There's a lot of change in teams every time you get new team on board. You know, how do you handle that? Okay. Uh, how does a project manager handle that? So my first answer is ban the project manager. No more project leader. <laughs> every time you get a new team. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, of course. I mean, uh, project leaders uh, we need to, to to deal with this. But normally in an organization, you have a core of people knowing themselves. Okay? So you don't get just foreign people. You need to start the emotional connection from scratch. So hopefully you know a number of people, not everybody, but you know a number of people who are going to be on your team. And that's a core from which you can build this emotional connection and this team. So here is what network will come in. Right? Excuse me? Network. Basically, uh, project managers' network will play a big role over here. Yeah, being, being in the organization, you'll know a, a number of the contributors. I think there was one last uh, question, and then I think we go need to go for lunch. OK, <laughs> thank you. Last question. Hi, Jeremy. Can you hear me? Try. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. My name is Amit. I come from the construction industry. Uh, my question is, again, on the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you go for a meeting and every specialist or discipline sitting inside the room and you have a junior manager up to the director level. You're saying that you remove the hierarchy, then who is taking the lead? And <laughs> it's, a, it's a really a war room. So huh? what's your take on that? OK, it seems that the, the hierarchy thing has a struck a chord in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, one of the big transformations we do in, uh, as a consultant, or we help doing in our, as consultants in organizations that tackle complex projects, is to go from a very hierarchical departmental structure into integrated project teams, where the, the team and the project leader has got a lot of power and recognition inside the organization. It's a very tough uh, cultural transformation for organizations, but it's the only way to tackle uh, complex issues is to have an empowered project team with a minimum supervision and not have too many departmental sub 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 manager looking in what you are doing okay and eventually when that's going to be widespread as a as a model because most organizations for me are going to become project based then the traditional hierarchy of all the departments and sub departments and sub sub departments will lose a lot of power they, they will just be restricted to providing the right resources but the guy doing the work are going to be project teams and the dynamics of the project teams. And in project teams which are working well, you don't have this issue about sitting with the manager and the director and the sub-manager. It's just people working together to achieve something. So generally, you don't have this hierarchical issue so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to invite uh, Seneca from PMI.
just to express um, a small token of appreciation from our side. And those of you who ask questions, you can come and grab your book after. Yeah, so you can collect your gift. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Really nice. Thank you. So, Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Right. So, yeah, those who have asked questions, please come under the stage to collect your gift. And for others, enjoy your lunch. We are going to start panel session after lunch. Um, yeah. See you soon.